Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, I am not going to talk to you about tubes today. I'm with uh, Dr. Wire today. I'm in the other section. Uh, I'm interested in the magnetic history of, of the moon. So how can we use pit craters as a way to look at that? Right now, what you're looking at isn't a tube. In fact, it's a stack of lava, you know, the opposite of a tube. Um, and uh, each one of these layers of lava that you're seeing, and we'll kind of dive into it later, uh, record something about the history of the time that they were in place, specifically because these are full of iron. Uh, they are natural, uh, they're natural preservers of the magnetic field that they were in placed in or some, some signal of that. So could we actually look at each one of these layers in succession and uh, tell something about the magnetic field that they were in placed in, or maybe the differences between them. Uh, if, you know, maybe they cool had different cooling histories, maybe they had uh, different iron abundances, maybe they had different oxygen fugacities that created different iron minerals to preserve things differently. So if you're interested in the magnetic history of the moon, um, then uh, this is a potential place to look at. If you're interested in how lava flows uh, change over over stratigraphy. This is a another place to look at. Um, let's uh, let, before I go on again. Thanks to the folks who went before me to talk about the importance of lava tubes, geodes, um, and this was supported by both geodes and and our Goddard Instrument Field Team at Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, you've seen a couple of these pictures right now, um, but uh, I direct your attention to uh, the graph on the bottom left. So uh, you've probably already heard this meeting and you know, and for the past number of decades that the moon is thought from sample return uh, from the Apollo era uh, to have had at least two magnetic epochs, a really strong magnetic epoch that sort of rivaled today's earth magnetic field three and a half billion years ago and before. And then after that, there was probably a, a low magnetic field, a low intensity magnetic field for a little longer or for a lot longer. Um, and luckily, uh, that's also when a lot of these lavas uh, that were in place in the mare were, were really going strong, both at the high air, uh, at this sort of hypothesized high strength area, uh, and also uh, during this transition. So um, this is a very simple line based on um, pretty relatively sparse data compared to what we have for the Earth. Uh, and there are lots of questions that this line actually represents or, or hides, depending on how you look at it. We don't know if the lunar dynamo uh, reversed ever. We don't know how much, you know, in time the lunar dynamo strengthened or weakened. We have a lot of questions about the lunar dynamo. We don't know, you know, you can ask, you know, the, the, the people who uh, really study this all the time, Sonia Tiku, Ben Weiss, and they'll tell you there are lots of ways to make a dynamo, and we don't know that either for the moon. So if only we had a stack of lava flows in succession as a nice natural outcrop, and we can look at the remnant lava flow or the remnant magnetization in each one of those to see how the, um, the magnetic field might have changed over a pretty short amount of time geologically compared to the length that's represented on this graph at the bottom left. Um, well, that's where pits come in and moon diving, cliff hanging, uh, uh, instrument suites are not a unique thing or not a new thing that I'm bringing to you in this community. So I won't talk about those either, but it would be interesting to strap a very small magnetometer to one of those things and then answer a lot of questions about the lunar history. So we wanted to check out, does this work? So we went to Hawaii for this. We didn't go to lava beds. As fun as that would be, we need a deeper pit. So we went to Devil's Throat. It's really aptly named. Uh, if you fall, you, you go all the way to hell. Um, it's 50 meters tall, 50 meters wide. That actually makes it really similar in dimensions to the lunar pits. It also has similar strata that you saw on the previous slide. Um, and it's not a lava tube but that doesn't matter. It could be a lava tube underneath here. The strata is what matters. Uh, again, same size uh, as some of these lava tubes that Robert Wagner and, and others have been looking at for the last number of years. 
this is our magnetometer setup. So this is our, um, you know, really cheap version of what Laura Kerber might do. Um, on the top left, far away from the other electronics is our three component flux gate magnetometer, just a meter magnetometer, commercial off the shelf. Um, but it's, you know, about twice as massive as the ones that uh, Goddard now makes for CubeSats. Keep that in mind. Um, and we have digital recording devices uh, to the right that uh, my co-author Stephen Scheidt really helped create. Oh, and then one really important thing is to track position with time. We have a GoPro, um, and I'll get into that in a bit. This is the uh, descent crane. This was developed by uh, Isha Ng, who's now in the um, tools group at, for Artemis at Johnson. She's uh, fantastic. Uh, this thing looks super thin, super light. It really is, and still it can hold a human. Uh, we did not get permission to descend humans down that craggy surface. Um, that would have been bad. This is it all set up with uh, Dr. Sheree Ackley's, um, you know, holding on to it with the boom uh, or with our crane and with the payload. Um, looks great. We descend it all the way down in four places across this, uh, this pit uh, and, and back up. These are the locations. And to give you a real sense of scale, you can see the people on the top if you can see those people. Then 50 meters down, you can see a little white dot that's our payload at the near the bottom, not at the bottom. Uh, it descended pretty slowly. It took about uh, 20 minutes to go all the way down and back up if we were doing it right. Uh, you could do it much quicker if you really wanted, but uh, the data would be a little weird. Uh, we collected great video, 4K, 60 frames per second, and then our magnetometer measurements were four hertz. This is the uh, uh, SFM model, the uh, shape from, uh, structure from motion model that Stephen Scheidt helped us put together for it. And it fits right next to USGS aerial LiDAR data uh, within 20 centimeters throughout. So great model. Um, so not only did we get that shape model, but from that we were able to export the camera positions with time. So that actually tells us exactly where the magnetic data was collected uh, along the surface. It also helped map this um, uh, cliff. So you can see the total magnetic field on the left. What I want you to take away is that here on Earth, it has about 3,000 nanoteslas of change. So that's very easy to tell, like, oh, yeah, like we're here at this lava flow, now we're at the next lava flow, uh, now we're at the next lava flow. On the moon, that might be a couple of orders of magnitude less, but still detectable by a, a flux gate magnetometer. So when the magnetometer is close to a cliff, you're able to see everything. Uh, you were able to see uh, really high scale changes very quickly um, when it's further from the cliff because we had a super vertical position. Uh, you had, uh, you know, longer, thank you, longer uh, wavelength uh, uh, signal to or, or signals. And that's just how potential fields work. You know, if you go to lunar orbit, you're only seeing, uh, you know, wavelengths of, of about 30 kilometers or larger. So this is still Fantastic. And then wobbles exist because the crane was actually, or the, uh, the payload was swinging a little bit, but we can now correct for that because we have these great structure for motion data. We made a little prism model. I won't go, I won't belabor that point. We used the shape, the structure for motion model uh, to make prisms. And then we just varied so far in this preliminary research, we vary the magnetic strength for each prism and we got a model out. Uh, what does this model tell us? This model tells us that the thicker lava flows have a higher magnetic intensity than the thinner lava flows. Uh, it also shows that there might that we might not be seeing, you know, some of this low, or we might not be able to detect the magnetic uh, intensity very well for the lower ones where it's actually farther away from magnetic observations. But the thicker ones seem to be more magnetic in this preliminary data uh, that we thought, or we uh, interpreted these to be a -a flows in the field. Uh, so that might be telling us something about the geologic history of the construction of the strata that's now exposed in this pit. Uh, so thanks to a bunch of people, but if, uh, if we go to the moon, it might be one or two orders of magnitude, uh, less of anomalies as we go down some, a, a field. Uh, for various reasons, I encourage you to read Ernie Bell's paper that we uh, put out about this, but we would still be able to detect these kinds of signatures. And then finally, thanks to Hawaii National Volcanoes National Park that let us do something crazy with hard hats, uh, to Liz Gallant, who helped us uh, be really safe in the field and also be really respectful 
of uh, the species that were present in the field. And then Kayla Berry got us there. So uh, thanks to her. So thank you. <laughs>